Welcome to the third session on this text, uh, Uttara Tantra, the Sublime Continuum uh, on Buddha Nature. So let's just take a moment before we begin to refresh our motivation. We won't do a formal meditation, but just get back in touch with what bodhicitta really is, this amazing mind that can help us to transform our minds into the state of a Buddha. As we've been talking about this weekend, we all have that potential. We have a mind that right now is together with these stains, but those stains are there adventitiously. And by realizing emptiness and practicing the bodhisattva path, engaging in all the meritorious deeds, the six perfections and so on, absolutely we can attain that, that goal. Without a doubt, we have the raw material from which all of that is formed. So set your sights on that goal. Again, with as little of a self-concern as possible. Absolutely, you do want to have Buddhahood for yourself, but it's not because you want it, it's because others need it. Because all the beings in the world who have been your kind mothers, not just once, but countless times, every single one of them continues to suffer. And if we want to truly help them to repay their kindness, we have to become enlightened for their sake. Okay, let's go ahead and see if there are any questions from this morning that might have come up over lunch or in... Yes, Anne. Um, Wait one second till the microphone. Okay. okay. Uh, just a simple question about uh, under results. So from the... So from the cause go. of faith in the Mahayana Dharma, the mm -hmm. result is perfection of purity. Mm -hmm. Is that renunciation? No. Okay, so is it renunciation? I mean, we could say that renunciation probably is developed along the way, but I think the intention, again, in the way that, that Geshe Tenzin Temple was talking about it in the passage that I shared, was the idea that that as you increase your faith and have more and more faith of conviction through the path, you you propel your movement towards that purity that is the perfection of purity, completely purifying the mind of uh, all the adventitious stains. Let's see if I can find it. I had it here somewhere. I don't know where I put that now. So I can read that little section again. How is devotion to the Mahayana the cause of purity? The four causes were explained in terms of their opposites. The opposite to devotion to the Mahayana is hatred or disdain for the Mahayana. That is a strong attachment to mundane things and you know, not feeling this desire to move in that direction. So due to devotion, due to devotion in the Mahayana, or to the Mahayana, we gradually reduce our attachment to mundane things and thereby gradually attain purity. So absolutely, you would, you would, all the realizations of the path that we normally talk about in the Lam Rim, you know, in terms of death and impermanence and the lower rebirth, I mean, all of that that moves you through to re developing renunciation, gets you to develop bodhicitta, gets you to practice the six perfections, all of that comes from your faith in the Mahayana. So it wouldn't stop at renunciation, but renunciation would be included in it, yeah. Thank you, Mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's that was my clever rap name that I came up for with for myself. But I haven't I haven't released any songs. So, <laughs> and sometimes I do a, duets with the notorious VTC, if you know who she is, <laughs> Venerable Tenzin Choki. We have taught together. No, I know. We don't sing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but she could. Okay. All right. Back to more serious matters. Buddhist rap? Pardon? Buddhist rap. Buddhist rap, maybe. <laughs> Have to put something together. If one of you can put something clever together from this weekend, you know, the Tatagata rap or something, you know. <laughs> All right. Any Any other questions? I hope that that means I'm explaining things clearly enough, but if there are things that I'm, I'm not, please let me know. Um, so 
again, let's go ahead and get back into the text. As I said previously, let's just review real quickly this sixth presentation that we looked at. The idea, again, was manifestation. This topic shows that Buddha nature exists in all beings, but that by nature it's the same, but there are different bases. Again, this is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And we talk about, again, the suchness of an ordinary being. That's the first of the three examples. The suchness of a learner superior, in this case, an Arya Bodhisattva, who has not yet attained Arya Buddhahood. And then the suchness of a Buddha superior, an Arya Buddha which is the nature, truth, body. The other two, of course, are naturally abiding lineage because they're the suchness that precedes attaining enlightenment together with still some level of stains. So in the first case, you have a mind where no stains have been removed, the second one where there's been partial removal of stains, and the third in which there has been complete removal of stains. So the suchness is the same. It's just the state of the being, the state of that mind of that being has changed. So now we're going to take this extension of this idea of states into four of the, the last four remaining uh, topics in regard to these presentations. They start with uh, the seventh one, which is states, or we could call, I think Alex Berzin calls it this, the phases of Buddha nature. Again, so the different states or phases in which that happens. Then we're going to go on to the eighth one, which is pervasion. Uh, I think Alex's term for this is Buddha nature penetrating everywhere. And then immutability, the constant inalterability of Buddha nature. And then finally, the last one, indivisibility, which I think he called the same thing, if I recall correctly. Again, you'll note that in the charts, there's, there are many of these sections that get much larger, and I won't be going into most of that detail. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to the seventh one states. The topic of states shows that although reality itself cannot be divided, it is divided from the point of view of the state of the non-removal of stains, the state of the partial removal of stains, and the state of the complete removal of stains. So it's not looking at the beings who are in those categories, it's looking at the state of what portion of the stains has been removed, if any. These divisions are made in order to understand that the mind improves and eventually achieves Buddhahood to kind of give us that idea that, that there can be a development of the mind in the midst of a constant suchness that is occurring, emptiness that is occurring. So let's read the verse that pertains to that. Impure, both impure and pure, and very pure, are respectively called the element of a sentient being, bodhisattva and Buddha. Now, sentient being, you know, is in this case maybe not the most correct term because it's not sentient being because even tenth crown bodhisattvas are sentient beings. You know, they're not yet, uh, uh, it would be more ordinary being. The term we often use in terms of distinguishing the progress on the path is that you have maybe a being that is not yet a bodhisattva, then you have an, or, and there'd be ordinary being, then an ordinary bodhisattva, which is up until the path of seeing, and then an Arya bodhisattva or superior bodhisattva, which is all the way through to enlightenment until it becomes a Buddha, you could still call it an Arya, but nonetheless, you know, that Arya bodhisattva uh, is generally one, you know, on the path until the, the end of the tenth ground. At the very end of the tenth ground, they go into their meditative equipoise, they remove the final obscurations the to, to knowledge, and they become an Arya Buddha. Arya Buddha, I mean, the term, by putting it with Buddha, is simply to talk about the person who is a Buddha, you know, in that way. But essentially, whenever it says Arya Bodhisattva, we mean someone who is not yet a Buddha, who is on the learning path. Yeah. Yes, Lynn. Uh, say more about, please, please say more about um, sentient being. Uh, do you, you don't mean just human beings in this? No, 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 no. Okay, you mean. so in other words, a hungry ghost could happen before a Bodhisattva and Buddha. Or an animal. Is that what it you're saying? It could be any ordinary being who has not yet removed any of the obscurations. Then oh, they, so yeah. all sentient beings. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Again, I don't think in any of the context does it talk about it being needing to be a human being or needing to be even an ordinary bodhisattva. It's just an ordinary being. And on the chart, that's essentially what it says. This is how it describes the three states uh, pertaining to the beings that have these different states of removal, kind of whether they are impure, both impure, and pure, very pure. So the three are the ordinary being, the Arya Bodhisattva, and then the Arya Buddha. 
So let's read the verse that kind of goes into this a little bit more. The basic constituent that is contained within these six topics of entity and so forth, that is causes, effect, function, possession, manifestation, and states, is indicated with those three names in terms of the, these three states, whereas in its entity there is not the slightest difference. So again, when we talk about the the naturally abiding lineage, the suchness of the mind, although you can reply it to all these various beings and they have difference in terms of their uh, development of their own minds, then the removal of impurities and what have you, uh, you can give it three names, but in entity, it's not different at all. It's the same suchness. So this is where we're talking about in this context of states. Although we can say there are those beings that have these states that we can identify, we're talking about the three, the suchness within the non-purification of stains, within that state, the suchness within the partial purification of stains, and the suchness within the state of having complete purification of stains. And pretty simple topics. This last part is like a breeze compared to some of the other ones to kind of get our heads around, I think. Any questions on that one? All right, the eighth presentation, uh, what we call here pervasion. As I said, uh, Alex called it this Buddha nature penetrating all or something. The presentation of pervasion indicates that the nature of the mind does not remain as it is now, but that it becomes better and better. It improves. As one practices the path, the qualities of the mind get better and better. The mind first has stains, then two, becomes partially free from stains, and then three, becomes completely free from stains. The suchness of mind pervades all states from ordinary being to Buddha. So we're talking about the pervasion of the suchness in the midst of a changing mind, in the midst of a mind that develops. Again, just different a aspects of looking at the sixth one, manifestation, from different angles, all right? Let's read the verse 48 that pertains to this one. Just as space, which has a non-conceptual and unobstructed nature, pervades undifferentiably all physical things, so the nature of the mind, the undefiled basic element, pervades all states of persons. So it's kind of using the, the analogy here once more of space, which if we talk about it as that unobstruct or the, ne the absence of obstructive contact, that pervades everywhere where there is space, everywhere that is part of existence. If there are, are beings existing in that space, then that space pervades everywhere. All physical things are pervaded by that space. As I said, we can even talk about space as being where something is located. The, the microphone couldn't be here if there wasn't an in a lack of obstructive contact. So space pervades everywhere. It's what allows things to occupy that dimension, you know, a three-dimensional world. So, Tathagata essence pervades the three states once more, what we saw from the, the manifestation. Ordinary beings, Arya Bodhisattvas, Arya Buddhas. But again, we're talking about kind of that pervasion that goes on. This is the verse that describes that in more detail. The pure basic element pervades the general character of all phenomena. Thus, it pervades all states of faulty common beings, bodhisattvas with good qualities, and Buddhas of final qualities. Just as space is omnipresent in low, middling, and supreme forms, such as earth, copper, and gold vessels. So here we're looking at once more three states that we're, that we're saying the suchness of the mind of those beings pervades, or suchness itself, pervades all of those states in an equal way. There's no difference. Again, it was like space. And the space in particular is the similar to the way that space pervades three different vessels that could be seen of inferior middling and superior substances. So we have earth as the inferior, if you had a clay mug or something, a clay um, vessel, uh, and then you had a copper vessel, and then you had a gold vessel. You know, in our world, we give more uh, value to the gold vessel, right? And less to the copper and even less to the clay. You can 
Just go price them, you know, <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> go to Etsy. And <laughs> so the analogy of space, when space pervades each of the three, a clay vessel, a copper vessel, and a gold vessel, it's always of the same nature, but it's given different names according to the vessel it pervades. So again, just in relation to that individual object, we might refer to it differently, the space that the copper vessel is occupying and so on. But nonetheless, you know, it's the same. So again, that's, that's, I don't know that I need to say more on many of these, these last ten, last four, because they're just looking at the idea that, again, the suchness of the mind of these three beings, you know, is exactly identical. Whether they have no um, removal of stains, they're still together completely with the stains, partially with the stains, or completely free of the stains. Let's go on to the ninth, which is the immutability, this unchangeability of Buddha nature. Um, so the topic of Im indivisible, I'm sorry, that went jumped to indivisibly. There's immutability, okay. Presentation of immutability does not mean that the mind does not change, because it's what we've been emphasizing as well to, through this whole course, right, is that you have this one track that is the developmental lineage that is changing as we progress on the path. And then you have the naturally abiding lineage, which is the emptiness, the suchness of that mind throughout the process of its change. So while the, the mind itself does change, it, it means here that the nature of mind doesn't change. Immutability is in terms of its suchness, its emptiness. Again, you know, we kind of know this, so I don't know that this one requires a lot of explanation either, but the nature of the mind always remains as it is, whether the stains have not been removed at all, the stains have been partially removed, or the stains have been completely removed. So it's just talking about these qualities of that suchness. So we've been mostly focusing again here on this naturally abiding lineage, that it has these qualities of pervasion, of immutability, of um, uh, what was the, the previous one? What was the states? I don't know. Anyway, you're getting the idea behind this, I think, without too much additional commentary. Let's read verse 50. That explains it just a little bit more. Even when the essential constituent is together with defilement, those faults are adventitious and suitable to be removed. Thus, they are not its nature. And its good qualities are naturally indivisible, unfit to be removed, and thus not adventitious. Therefore, as it was before when in cyclic existence, so it is later in nirvana, always of unchangeable nature. So, again, this idea that... Um, this middle part here, you might qu question that. Its good qualities are naturally indivisible, unfit to be removed, and thus not adventitious. We would say the one, of course, that we're talking about mostly is the fact that it is empty of inherent existence. This is not, this is a good quality. <laughs> this is the whole point of earlier, its function. Its function is to move us in a way of greater goodness and eventually definite goodness of being able to be uh, separated from the afflictive obscuration, separated from the uh, knowledge obscurations. Its main good quality is its emptiness, which is not, it's not divisible. We can't really divide that emptiness up. It's unfit to be removed, thus not adventitious. It's our natural state. It's our naturally abiding lineage that is, has always been there. Now, whether there are other good qualities that we would say are sort of resident within the mind, to some extent we have to say th that there are things I, I like to use the word resonant with our minds, not necessarily resident, but we do talk about every being having the seeds of compassion, every being having the seeds of love and kindness and all the things that we talk about. So even the most hardcore being in terms of someone who is intent upon ill will and malice and what have you still has some seeds of virtue within their mind, something that can grow and develop. But it doesn't mean that we, ha just like developing our wisdom, we have to attend to that. It doesn't mean that we've got this natural source of just immeasurable compassion within us already. We have the seeds from which all of that can arise. And as I said when I explained last night how all the good qualities are supported in wisdom. Right now they're together with ignorance, but they can be supported in wisdom and complemented by wisdom, grown by wisdom. 
So in a sense, we can say that those are part of it. I know when Venerable Rabina teaches, she often emphasizes, and that's probably how Lama Yeshe taught, right? To say that, you know, fundamentally we are these compassionate, loving, kind beings inside ourselves. I mean, I, I agree, but to some extent we have to also admit that, again, it doesn't mean that that's who we already are and we can just rely on that. We have to still develop all those qualities. So they too are part of the developmental lineage. They are part of what we mean by changing our minds, not just increasing our wisdom to no emptiness, but increasing the capacity of our hearts to embrace all beings and to develop that great compassion and so on. So again, the Tathagata essence itself then is immutable, unchangeable throughout the three states, the ordinary beings, the Arya beings, the Arya Buddhas, or Arya Bodhisattvas and the Arya uh, Buddhas. And I've got a little note here. I mean, note that there is much more on chart one. Uh, in there's like three pages where he goes into an extensive description of all this stuff around different bodhisattvas. Because this does get into this idea at this juncture about bodhisattvas and why do they, the reasons why they keep coming back into an embodied form to, you know, do different work. And there's like eight reasons in the, the longer text that if you do study this text that set out kind of the various ways in which bodhisattvas need to come back to samsara to continue to do various work. You know, sometimes they come back simply to be able to uphold the dharma in a world where the dharma is declining, you know, those sorts of things. I can read them for you if you want. Do you want to hear them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. This is on Geshe Tenzin Temple talks about this on pages 40 and 41. I think it's my little blue tab here. The first one is they deliberately take rebirth in order to complete their collection of merit. Obviously, this is an important part of it, right? Because you have to have the requisite merit. As I said, if you move, if you look at one, I would have a little chart for the basic program that I didn't distribute as part of this, but it shows as you move through these levels, the five paths I mentioned, path of accumulation, what Rinpoche now calls the path of merit, the path of preparation, seeing, uh, meditation, and path of no more learning. For the four learning paths, before you become a Buddha, there's an amount of merit that you have to have equal to, in total, three countless great eons. Um, you know, this is like unfathomable how much merit. But you, it doesn't mean you have to live that long to accumulate it. You just have to accumulate that amount of merit that would be there for that duration of time. So you can accumulate it in sometimes some very powerful ways. And in Tantra, of course, you accumulate it really quickly through using Tantric methods, especially in highest yoga Tantra. But essentially, for the first two grounds, you have to accumulate the, your first great countless eon of merit. For the path of seeing up through the pure grounds, until you get to the pur pure grounds, you have to do a second great countless eon of merit. Or I'm not sure if it's great count. I think it's great countless, not countless great. That's what I said earlier. Great countless eon. Isn't it? I'm not sure. <laughs> countless great eon, great countless eon. It, it's one or the other. You know? Then you finally get to the last three grounds of the path of meditation, the pure grounds. You've removed the afflictive obscurations. You're trying to work on the knowledge obscurations. Just to get that done requires an entire <laughs> countless great eon. It is countless great eon. I was right the first time. Okay. So... It's just this first idea is they deliberately take, take rebirth in order to complete their collection of merit. Secondly, they deliberately take rebirth in order to care for other sentient beings. You know, that there are sentient beings that through their insight they see need care, need to be attended to, probably those in their retinue that they are trying to ripen to make sure that they tend to. They deliberately take rebirth in order to meet a Buddha in another body. For example, at the time of Buddha Shakyamuni, there were many Arya beings who took birth as his disciples, due to the force of the faith they had developed in him in pre previous lives. The fourth one, since in general it's not easy to take care of many disciples, but requires patience and enthusiasm, they deliberately take rebirth in order to strengthen their resolve and eliminate all discouragement. So it's like a test for them to continually do that and, and to keep going back to strengthen that resolve. They deliberately take rebirth in order to preserve the Dharma, like I mentioned earlier. And they said, for example, in order to ensure that the doctrine of Buddha Shakyamuni did not become weak and disappear, holy beings such as Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and Shantideva took rebirth in the world. 
And even although Atisha was told by Tara that if he were to remain in India, he would live till the age of 90, whereas if he were to go to Tibet, he would be of great service to sentient beings, but would die 20 years earlier, he didn't become discouraged, you know, and went to uphold the Dharma in Tibet and, you know, sacrificed 20 years of that life, you know. So, uh, again, this is how bodhisattvas function. They, if there's a benefit to the Dharma, they will do that. So they will definitely take rebirth for that. They deliberately take rebirth in order to generate joy and enthusiasm in teaching the Dharma. And then Geshe Tenzin Temple says, in general, it is difficult to please others. For example, <laughs> just as the beggars in India are not easily pleased with the offerings made to them, whereby some people think to give up making offerings to them, so too are sentient beings difficult to please. In spite of this, bodhisattvas take rebirth in order to overcome this thought and generate joy in working to please them. So maybe you can have that in San, San Francisco too, right? Or we have homeless folks in Santa Fe as well, not quite as many, but you might give to them and they might seem not so pleased at what you gave them, you know, but you just don't lose your, you know, desire to, to give, to be a benefit, to please others, to do what you can. The seventh one, they deliberately take rebirth in order to continue to develop the mind of enlightenment bodhicitta, the base or support, as well as the bodhisattva conduct that is supported on it. Eighth one, they deliberately take rebirth in order to practice the six perfections, you know, to do what you can to uh, practice generosity, morality, patience, joyous enthusiasm, concentration, wisdom. So I think, you know, some of those are pretty obvious, but I thought some of them were a little interesting, you know, that there can be times when bodhisattvas take rebirth simply in a world because they want to accomplish some of these other tasks. So, sure. <laughs> All right, are we ready to move on to the last of the 10 presentations? Get my papers together here, let's see. The 10th presentation, indivisibility. The topic of indivisibility means that <laughs> when suchness <laughs> progresses, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> You can read with me if you want. Okay, the topic of indivisibility means that when suchness progresses to the suchness of the mind free from all stains, the suchness of the mind of an ordinary being is not different from the suchness of the mind of an Arya Buddha. And therefore, there are no divisions of suchness in this sense. So once more, we're just talking about suchness from a different angles. It's indifferentiability, it's immutability, and so on. All right. There are three types of beings who become enlightened. This is kind of an interesting tidbit. Those who were previously hearers who become Buddhas, because again, they finish their path to liberation, they check out and go abide in their solitary peace, but then they're nudged back by the Buddhas to enter the Mahayana. So they eventually finish the Mahayana and become Buddhas. Those who were previously solitary realizers who become Buddhas, they did the same thing on the solitary realizer track. I mentioned how the hearers like to, you know, listen and engage in the Mahayana and what have you. They're more congregating. The solitary realizers, they obviously have to depend upon teachers, but they make strong prayers that in their last life, uh, before they attain liberation, that they can be born in a place where there are no Buddhas, so that they can achieve it in a solitary way on their own. Um, and it's interesting because they do say that they, uh, His Holiness says that they've got, uh, seem to have more compassion than perhaps the hearers, because they do that in part so that they can then teach others in that world in the remainder of that life after they've attained liberation, and they teach them through all, ki through all kinds of miraculous feats and things like that. So they try to gain some inspiration or give some inspiration to those uh, beings who they are able to teach to. And then finally, you have those who were previously bodhisattvas who become Buddhas, which are you know those who simply have entered the bodhisattva path right from the get-go, right from the beginning, and then see it through to the end. However, on the Buddha ground, the qualities and knowledges of these three enlightened beings are not different. You know, whether they've done track A, which is all the way through the here, and then up to through all the Mahayana, or track B, which is all the way through the solitary realizer, then through the Mahayana, or just from the very beginning entered the Mahayana and finished it, their suchness isn't different. So this is a slightly different example in terms of the three beings, but it's a similar type of idea, that there is no difference in terms of the suchness. So let's read this rather elaborated verse. Because the basic constituent at the time of purity is the truth body of all Buddhas, and it is the ones gone thus, 
It is also the truth of superiors as well as the ultimate nirvana. Thus, since those are just variants in name, just as the sun and its rays are indivisible, the truth body, which is the final nirvana and its qualities, are indivisible in entity. Hence, there is no fully qualified nirvana aside from Buddhahood. So, again, um, there's a deeper description of this that is on your chart um, uh, for this 10th presentation. Let's go through that. Uh, a Buddha possesses indivisibly every quality of wisdom, knowledge, and abandonment of the hearers, solitary realers, and the Mahayanas. This is where we, we look at one more interpretation of indivisibility in terms of saying that the mind, the the uh, mind of that Buddha who has fully removed all stains, the qualities that are within it and its suchness and everything else are, are indivisible. They're all there together. It's like all one composite. It's not like there's anything missing or lacking. Or um, uh, So the four qualities that are indivisibly possessed by a perfect Buddha are the Dharmakaya, which here refers to the nature body, the ultimate reality of a Buddha's mind. So the emptiness is there as part of that final result, because the emptiness is always there in regard to anything that exists. The Tathagata, which refers to the exalted wisdom directly realizing that nature body or ultimate reality, which would be you know, an aspect of the wisdom truth body. Number three, the noble truth of cessation or ultimate truth, which is the complete abandonment of adventitious stains. They say, of course, once you attain that state of Buddhahood, you have completely abandoned all adventitious stains, so you have a complete cessation at that point. You have absolutely nothing more that needs to be ceased. Um, that cessation is there in its most complete form. And then the ultimate nirvana, the attainment of that state, the final nirvana, which is Buddhahood. Um, so this is essentially referring to the knowledge or the realizations that are there in the mind of that Buddha. Um, and then the abandonments that are also there. These last two qualities are more along the abandonments. Sometimes we even talk about, I think this was from Maitreya's, oh, is it the Sutra Alamkara? I can't remember. We studied uh, in uh, uh, Ornament, it went into that a little bit, how we can divide the qualities of a Buddha essentially into two, the knowledge and realizations and the abandonment, which are kind of, again, all the qualities that we develop that are the perfection of all of that that we realize, and then the abandonment, the complete removal of all the stains, which are what are entailed in the word sangye, right? You know, the, in the Tibetan, they translated Buddha as sang, meaning completely purified, completely abandoned, and then gye, completely developed and purified, or uh, developed and cultivated. So the first two are those that are completely developed and cultivated, you know, the complete knowledge, uh, complete wisdom mind of a Buddha. And then we have the uh, complete abandonment, cessation of all of the adventitious stains. I wanted to read, I think there's something in Keshe Tenzin Temples again that I had notes to read. Not sure if I remember studying this before coming in here today, but we'll read it anyway and see what, what Keshe Temple says. Keshe Temple was amazing. He, he, he used to be the Umze at Sarah, and he had this like booming voice. He was really quite a interesting... Um, teacher. Let's see, where am I at here? Where did he live? Oh, he's still alive. Yeah. Okay, he's not. Okay. He's actually in the master's program at Italy now. He's one of the teachers because oh. after Geshe Jampi Gyatso passed away, my teacher passed away in 2007, just before beginning the second master's program. Um, right. uh, then they had to scurry to kind of fill, get people to fill in, and he was already there. And they said, "Do you are you comfortable teaching ornament?" And he was like, "Not really, but I guess if you have need me to do so." And that was what I heard, at least. <laughs> he's qualified. Don't trust me. He's yeah. got amazing knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but he was very humble and kind of not really wanting to take that on. And then they got Geshe Jampa Tekchuk, Kenshu Jampa Tekchuk, to come and teach Middle Way, which was really quite special, from what I hear. And then I think uh, they've got this other uh, Geshe, Geshe um, Jampa, Ch uh, what's his name? He came to Taos for a little bit to try to hone up on his English. And so the group in Taos hosted him for that time. Um, Geshe Jampa Chodak, I think is his name. No? Chodak? I can't remember. Anyway, he's teaching the Tantra courses now, and he may even be teaching more than that. 
But um, yeah, they managed to find some Geshe's to fill in. So Geshe Tenzin Temple is quite qualified. So he goes into this, um, some description of this that maybe is a little bit more, more elaborate than what I said. I don't know if we want to do that or not, but the very first one he says, there are four reasons that the perfect Buddhas indivisibly possess the qualities of wisdom and so forth, of the hearers and so forth. The first reason is that the perfect Buddhas possess them because they are the Dharmakaya or truth body that is pure from the very beginning. And the qualities of photo stories and so forth are ultimately indivisible from the Dharmakaya. Similarly, because we too possess the Buddha nature, there's no ultimate separation or division between our mind and the Dharmakaya or truth body. So that's the first one of these four. The second reason is that because perfect Buddhas possess the final quality of directly realizing you know, emptiness, they are known as Tathagatas, or ones gone thus. That was all he said for that one. It's kind of that they've realized thusness completely, uh, developed that full exalted wisdom. Then in regard to the two that have to do with abandonment, he says the third reason is that because the perfect Buddhas are the final abandonment that is the exhaustion of all adventitious defilements, they are the Arya truth of cessation. They have a exemplified the complete cessation, the truth of that. The fourth reason is that the perfect Buddhas are a non-abiding nirvana. So when I said ultimate nirvana being the final nirvana, it's not to say that it's an equivalent nirvana to what the uh, hearers in solitary realize experience. They certainly have the same state of having been freed from all of the afflictive obscurations. But moreover, the Buddhas have been freed from all of the knowledge obscurations and are abiding in what's called, or in what's called a non-abiding nirvana, meaning that they're not abiding in the solitary peace that the arhats did when they checked out of their life after they're attaining that state, uh, checked out of samsara and so on, but rather um, they're also not abiding in samsara because they're completely free from the stains of samstara, samsara. So they're not abiding in the two extremes of samsara and nirvana, rather they are in that state of Buddhahood that is perfectly manifesting for sentient beings, continue to do that within uh, the realm of beings, and at the same time never parted from their own internal uh, pacification due to having removed all those factors. So I don't know, there's more in here on this, but maybe that's enough. I don't know, I just, I hadn't, hadn't looked at that. I somehow missed my little note on that, but I didn't want to shortchange you on anything in regard to any information that might have been there. Any questions on that? All right, so we have a little um, kind of one more description in terms of this analogy. Remember, we saw this earlier, right? Back here in the third line of this, it said, thus, since those are just variants in name, just as the sun and its rays are indivisible, the truth body, which is the final nirvana, and its qualities are indivisible in entity. So here we're going to look at the analogy of the sun a little bit more. The wisdom knowing the mode of being, the exalted wisdom knowing the varieties, and the release from objects of abandonment, because of being clear, radiant, and pure, and because of not being different from the nature of the one basis element, are respectively similar to the light, rays, and pure disk of the sun, and the non-difference of those three. Um, Let's go ahead and read the rest of this, and then I'm going to read from uh, Geshe Loden's book on this, so get his explanation. It says, Therefore, without attaining Buddhahood, in which all defilements are purified, a fully qualified nirvana is also not attained. As aside from completing abandonment and realization together, it does not happen that they are completed individually just as the sun cannot be seen separately from light and light rays. So again, in the state of Buddhahood, all of these qualities being there in the same way as this example of light and light rays. So let me put this back on the screen, the previous verse, and read a little bit from a bedtime story. No, uh, this does make you go to sleep at night sometimes. <laughs> if you read, no, It's a wonderful book. <laughs> What I'm looking at is this wonderful book that is, I don't even, I think it's still in print, but all of Geshe Loden's book, he was a wonderful Geshe that taught in Australia, in uh, Melbourne area, Melbourne, Melbourne area, I think they say. 
Um, anyway, he uh, passed away a few years back, but he put together his own publication companies called, called Tushita Publications. And he um, wrote a couple, quite a few good books. We were talking last night in the car about how wonderful his Lam Rim book is, his Stages of the Path book. It's really quite nice, very easy to study. This is an entire book on uh, Buddha nature called The Fundamental Potential for Enlightenment. The problem is all his books are produced in Australia. They're printed there, and they're very expensive to get them into this country and buy them. I mean, and I don't know. At one point, like used copies of his Lam Rim text, which is fairly thick, were like over $200 on Amazon. I was showing that book to people, and they were like trying to buy it, and I'm like going, that's a lot of money to pay for a Dharma book. Did you really? Yeah. Go girl. You can you can sell that on Amazon. <laughs> Retire. <laughs> um, so let's look at this analogy of the sun, its light, and the rays of, of the light. So he says, the sun, its light, and rays are inseparable. One never exists without the others. Similarly there, similarly, there are three factors at the point of attaining enlightenment that are said to be inseparable. The first is wisdom. And this refers to the wisdom directly perceiving the ultimate truth. Again, that's that Dharmakaya that we looked at that, you know, was the, I'm sorry, the wisdom was the second one, the Tathagata. The Dharmakaya, again, the, this is a, in, everything is inseparable from this nature body, from this emptiness. The first is that Tathagata, it's number two on our chart here, which refers to the exalted wisdom directly realizing that. That is said to be clear because it makes reality or suchness very clear, and in this way, it is like the clear light of the sun. The second is pristine awareness, and this refers to the simultaneous realization of all manner of conventional truths. So here we actually go into, it was the other verse perhaps I should be referring to. No, it's this one, up at the top. So the wisdom knowing the mode of being is the first. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have related it to that previous thing. It's more related to what's in this verse. The very first one, that's what we just looked at. That's like the light of the sun. Okay, everybody okay with that correction that I just made? It is kind of identical to what I looked at there, but I was in the wrong list. The second one, the exalted wisdom knowing the varieties. By varieties, we mean all the conventional phenomena that appear. They often call, call them the mode and the varieties, as they are indicated here by Jeffrey Hopkins. Geshe Loden says on this, the second is the pristine awareness, and this refers to the simultaneous realization of all manner of conventional truths. It is said to be illuminating because it illuminates the various aspects of all objects of knowledge, like the illuminating rays of the sun. So again, that's its, he used the term radiant in this translation of the verses uh, from Jeffrey Hopkins. The third is the release, and this refers to the final path of release from the obstructions to omniscience, which is the attainment of Buddhahood. So, and again, the first line, we see that third indicated, and the release from objects of abandonment, the complete release from them, meaning that they are uh, overcome through the power of our wisdom so that they won't return again. So when you talk about, let's just set this aside for just a second, and we talk about this meditative equipoise, this period of time that the bodhisattva is in meditation on emptiness. What is happening is that gets divided into two parts. The first part is what's called the uninterrupted path. They say they enter into this meditative equipoise when they see emptiness directly. It's an uninterrupted path because from that point onward, there's nothing that disturbs the bodhisattva from that. I think it was um, Kensur Yeshe Tupton in his book, Path to the Middle, that Anne Klein translated, where he said you, an, an atomic bomb could go off and the bodhisattva wouldn't be disturbed from that meditative equipoise. That's like the antidote, is the uninterrupted path. That direct realization of emptiness that is occurring acts as an antidote to some level of the obscurations. As soon as that happens, the very next moment is the path of release meaning that at that point, once you have act, put an antidote to that wisdom, it's like turning on the light in a, in a dark room, the darkness is gone, it's released. It'll never occur again. So in that second moment, what's often called liberated path or path of release is where the actual cessation has occurred then. The act of it being ceased through the uninterrupted path is happening first and then its actual cessation is the very next moment. The fact that it is gone won't, won't appear again. There's one of those as you move through, 
every one of these grounds, you know, from the first ground all the way up till the tenth ground. When you get to the end of the tenth ground and you generate your final exalted uh, wisdom, that is your meditative equipoise, it's called the Vajra-like stabilization. You go into this meditation and you have your uninterrupted path, which is your direct realization of emptiness at that last moment that's going to remove the subtlest of the obscurations to knowledge, to omniscience. And then as soon as you cross over into the path of release, you're a Buddha at that point. It's all done. You're in the path of no more learning at that stage. So he's saying essentially that that release that occurs there, that is the release from all the objects of abandonment, the final release, the final path of release, uh, that's said to be pure because it's totally and finally freed from the last vestige of the two obscurations. In this way, it is like the sun freed from obscuring clouds. So it itself is like the sun. The illumination of the sun is like the wisdom knowing all the conventional phenomena. And the rays of the sun, I'm sorry, the light of the sun. No, it was the rays early. Wisdom is said to be clear. It's like the clear light of the sun. Yeah, so the clear light of the sun is like knowing emptiness, the mode of existence of all phenomena, and then the uh, the rays, the illumination of the sun uh, are like knowing the variety of things that a Buddha has to know in order to serve other beings. So you have kind of at the moment of that release when the, you cross over, all these qualities are indivisible from the truth body of a Buddha. You know, They're all kind of abiding at the same time. It's not like one happens and then the other happens or that there's an absence of one at any one time. Uh, the complete release has happened, the complete knowledge. Uh, these two aspects, again, indicating essentially what we mean by a Buddha, somebody who has developed complete knowledge, wisdom, qualities, somebody who has completely abandoned everything that obscures. Okay, so in the, with that verse we already read, but again, uh, the idea is without attaining Buddhahood in which everything's defiled, you also can't attain that fully, quiet, fully qualified final nirvana, that non-abiding nirvana. You know, everything happens together. It doesn't happen individually. Just as the sun can't be seen separately from the light and the light rays, you know, from the light and the illumination. Any questions on number 10? Like I said, I think each of that may even have like a little bit more in the text. I'm not sure in the, whoa, what did I do there? It got bigger. Let me escape out of it. No, there, good enough. Did what I needed to do. Any final comments? Maybe we'll take our little stretch break now then before we come back and do the similes because it's closer to about an hour and it is afternoon and a bit warm. So um, take a little, um, oh wait, let's, there is one verse that summarizes. <laughs> Two verses that summarize maybe. No, one. Let's look at the summarizing verse. We'll read that and then we'll take our break. Thus the ten presentations, ranging, f ranging from entity through qualities of the essence of conquerors, have been expressed. Voila, there they are, you know, raging. <laughs> They're free-ranging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to go on to our last part, which, again, I didn't plan to go through all nine of these similes, so we'll go through what we can. But I also want to do the concluding part because it's a real interesting little part that Gyaltsip J uh, makes some nice commentary on in terms of our study of this text and the importance of it. So let's take a break, maybe till it's about five minutes to three, so maybe till five after three. Is that good enough? Give people 10 minutes just to stretch and get refreshment. Okay, let's go ahead and begin, or resume. Probably a better way to put it. So, just to, to review in terms of the slide that I had earlier about these two different parts of the text that we're mainly examining, having introduced Buddha nature, we then looked at the 10 presentations that established the clear light nature of the mind. Again, also establish the second topic, too. I mean, th these two are intertwined, certainly, that there is this conventional clear light nature of the mind, that it means, you know, the mind is fundamentally pure, 
and therefore the stains can be removed. And then also that the defilements or contaminations are adventitious, which is what the nine similes establish by using an example of always something that is uh, representing our fundamental nature and then something that is obscuring that and how the obscuration can be removed to reveal that fundamental nature. So this is the whole topic that shows that they are not part of the nature of the mind, these stains, and therefore can be eliminated. So let's um, look at this verse that introduces this idea of the similes. Uh, that such an essential constituent now dwells inside the covering of afflictive emotions of sentient beings is to be known by way of examples as its entity is not now known. So this is the whole idea that, that most beings in this world are not aware of their Buddha nature. You know, they are like walking around with this great wealth that they're totally obscured to. This is, you know, some of the ideas that we're going to see in regard to these similes is that there's always something that is obscuring us from knowing that and as essentially this covering, this obscuring factor of our own afflictive emotions, of our own, you know, ignorance of the variety of things certainly, but certainly the ignorance of that reality, that emptiness that is the... Uh, the naturally abiding lineage that we possess. So this is an introduction to all nine of these that we're going to go through and uses a it kind of sets out the various examples. Like a Buddha dwelling inside an ugly lotus, honey in the middle of many bees, a kernel inside a husk, gold within filth, a treasury of jewels in the earth under the house of the destitute, the capacity of growing stalks and so forth, existing in a small seed, the image of a conqueror made from a precious substance inside a tattered garment, a lord of humans who is a universal monarch inside the womb of a lowly woman, and a precious golden image in an earthen mold, this naturally pure, essential constituent dwells in sentient beings, obscured with the adventitious defilements of afflictive emotions. So he's essentially setting out this idea that you have various analogies or similes that are going to be used to show how we have within us this Buddha nature that we are obscured to. So the final verse that kind of introduces this is the uh, kind of showing what the defilements are. Those were all what's being obscured. Now we're looking at what is it that's defiling because it's a variety of things. It's everything included within the category of the afflictive emotions, but nonetheless we can look at other factors that pertain to that whole idea. The obscuring defilements are similar to a lotus, living bees, husk, filth, earth, fruit, tattered garment, woman pain by burning suffering, and earth constituent. So one thing you can do while we're going through this, if you have the charts in front of you, is just to use this chart four. Chart three goes into more detail on the similes, and I will be referring to some of what's there. But nonetheless, chart four is a nice little summary of all of this. It has the nine in terms of what the first what the simile is for that each of the nine, the obscuring, meaning what it is that is the covering, as this slide points out, what it is that's kind of getting in the way of our knowing that, and then what is obscured, which of course is representing our Buddha nature, but nonetheless representing various aspects of it. Then you have a meaning of each of those, the meaning of the obscuring and the meaning of the obscured. And what you'll notice is in that last column, the meaning of the obscured, although while it's referring in general to Buddha nature or lineage, it's correlated to each of the threefold natures. Remember that we saw those in the very first presentation. The threefold nature being dharmakaya, the uh, suchness, kind of the emptiness, and there's only one of them that's correlated to that, and then lineage, meaning generally the developmental lineage, though sometimes even it would be the naturally abiding lineage, or some aspect of those, again, that we'll get into when we look at these. So this is the idea of what we're going to be looking at, is that there is, whoops, 
I hope no, no, I went to the <laughs> I hit I hit home. I should never have hit home. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Okay, back up now. In each in this way, for each simile there are four components, which again we're on the chart. There's the obscure obscuration, or kind of what is obscuring, the obscured, the meaning of the obscuring, and the meaning of the obscured. So I, yeah probably should have changed that first one to obscuring. But anyway, you get the idea. Something that's covering, something that's being covered. And we're going to talk about them in terms of the analogy, but they're going to talk about them in terms of what they represent. So for this afternoon, I think we should have time to go through three of these. A Buddha in a withered lotus, which is the very first one. I mean, kind of like a Buddha figure, a uh, Buddha statue, what have you. Gold inside filth, that you have this precious gold that is within dirt, mud, you know, waste, whatever. And then you have a precious image existing within a clay mold. So you have a clay mold that you've made this beautiful object inside of, but from the outside, it just looks like clay. Whereas you've got a gold image that's inside there, all right? Or a precious image. The first simile, a Buddha in a withered lotus. Everybody kind of on board for where we're going with this? All right, good. Let's read verse 100. For example, a one gone thus, blazing with the thousands of magnificences of the major and minor marks, dwelling inside a lotus of ugly color, is seen by someone having the undefiled divine eye and is taken out from the lotus petals to be shown to others. Similarly, the one gone to bliss sees with the undefiled Buddha eye the reality of natural clear light even in those transmigrators dwelling in the most torturous hell and having a nature of compassion dwells here at length undefiled, releasing trainees gradually from defilement. Just as one with the divine eye sees a one gone thus dwelling inside an ugly closed lotus and cuts away the petals so that it may be seen, so the compassionate subduer sees the essence of a perfect Buddha dwelling in all transmigrators, obstructed by the coverings of the defilements of desire, hatred, and so forth, and engages in activities to destroy those defilements of the basic constituent. So in the first simile, there's a Buddha form. They say it's the form of a Tathagata, but again, it's the idea of, of a kind of that residing within what is obscuring it, which is a, a lotus. And here it's like an, by ugly color, they don't mean that it was an unpleasant lotus from the beginning, Me, they mean it's withering, it's yeah. becoming foul, it's not something that you would normally keep on your table after it's gotten to that state, you would send it to your compost pile or whatever. The meaning of these are explained in the following words, they've already given a lot of the meaning, and this is the only one that kind of does that, the very first one kind of talks about all these things that the Buddha does and what have you. I mean, we had like three verses, as you saw, that expound upon it. So it's already a bit clear in terms of the example that, you know, you have, if you had somebody with this divine eye or whatever, this Buddha eye that was able to see, oh, there's a Buddha form within that withering lotus, then you could cut it open so that beings could see it and have access to it. So let's read. Now, what's interesting is you'll notice the verses skip here now. We went from 102 to 135. That's because they go through sequentially all of what is obscured or obscuring and then all which is obscured anyway you get the point they go to all of them together all nine and then they go through the next nine so i'm kind of inserting the verses to all go with the one example <laughs> all right so let's read verse 135 just as a lotus born from mud pleases the mind when it is newly present but later when old does not please so when the latencies of desire become manifest attachment through improper mental application, one is happy, but when it ceases, one is unhappy, due to which it is like the pleasure of seeing a lotus. So the meaning of the obscuring, the lotus, is that it refers to dormant attachment. So we had here, again, the Buddha form and the lotus in the example, that was the simile. Then we had... The, in this verse, the description of what the lotus represents. 
And on your chart, you'll see that that's the meaning of the obscuring. As it says in the verse, you have this analogy of the lotus because when it's new and beautiful and has all the colors quite rich and you know enjoyable, then it is something that you have great attachment for you. It's creating that pleasure. But as it gets old, which you know all produced things have some change that they're you know is expressed in them eventually, and most of the products that we have in our world, things that are produced, uh, do have that tendency to fade with time. Right? They're no longer as lustrous, as delicious as they looked initially. So flowers are a very good example for this, and the lotus in particular is being used here to show that we lose our attachment as it becomes older. So when the latencies of desire become manifest attachment through our improper mental application, we're happy. We seem to be happy because we're getting what attachment seems to want. But when it ceases, one is unhappy, due to which one is like, it's like the pleasure of seeing a lotus that changes over time as the lotus withers and fades. So is it the same with all most of our objects of attachment, certainly of the senses. You know, we might buy something that's really um, beautiful, but as it fades in time, our attachment for it is, is gone. So the dormant attachment that arises at that point, that manifests in that way, and then declines on the basis of impermanence. Verse 147, here we're jumping ahead again quite a ways because we're looking now at the meaning of the obscured. Since the realizational doctrine body is beyond the world, an example capable of illustrating it is not observed in the world. Therefore, the body of a one gone thus and the basic constituent are indicated to be similar. So this is kind of saying that we're, 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 the analogy is referring to the, the dharmakaya, what is called here the realizational doctrine body kind of knowing that and having anything that exemplifies it is beyond the world because there's nothing comparable to it. But illustrating it is, in this case, is going to be using the body of a tatagata that is hidden inside this withered lotus. You know. So these are indicated in the, in the analogy to be similar. So the meaning of the obscured, what is obscured in terms of the body of a tatagata is the dharmakaya. Again, this is the first of the threefold nature. Um, so it says the meaning of the obscured, the Buddha form, is that it refers to the Tathagata essence in general, and in particular, the Dharmakaya of realization. Because remember, all of these, in terms of the meaning of the obscured, are Buddha nature, or Tathagata essence, or Buddha lineage, or whatever you, term you use for them. We're just going to talk about them in terms of the threefold nature. First, we're going to look at Dharmakaya, which is the first three, I won't go into the other two in such great detail. Then we're going to go into suchness, which is the fourth, and then we're going to go into the lineage, which is the fifth through the ninth. So the Dharmakaya of realization is a fully developed exalted wisdom directly realizing the sphere of qualities of the mind and is ultimately without stains, because there are no stains of inherent existence, no natural stains, and certainly no adventitious stains at that point either. So let me see. I think that pretty much finishes up this first simile. Ah, we have one more slide. Okay. The Tathagata essence or suchness of sentient beings' minds is obscured from being seen by them due to dormant attachment. Thus, sentient beings have obscurations with regard to the attainment of a Buddha's wisdom, Dharmakaya, directly realizing emptiness. This again was on your chart, but it's essentially saying that this is one factor that is obscuring our minds. Remember how we talked about even like our attachment to mundane things becomes problematic. It's something we have to overcome. It's a fault. So dormant attachment, we're going to see in the next example, dormant hatred. In the next example, dormant ignorance. All three of the root poisons in their dormant form act as an obscuration because they don't remain dormant. They arise when we are triggered by various objects. When we have something delicious and delightful, like a beautiful flower or whatever the case might be, or something that induces our anger or our hatred to arise or for our ignorance to manifest. So these three are you know, the, the main afflictions. All of the other afflictions, secondary afflictions and so on are said to arise from those three. That's why we call them the three root poisons. Okay, any...
comments on or questions on the first simile. So let's hold this slide, and what we're going to do is jump back to the chart. If you don't have this again, I'm just going to go through it in a very brief way to introduce the simile, but we won't explain it in its full detail, just what's on here on the sheet. The second one is you imagine that you have honey that's amidst a, sw a swarm of bees. The swarm of bees are all over the honey, or the, I mean, honey is kind of weird. Maybe you can talk about like a hive or something, you know, the, the hive containing the honey. But you have a swarm of bees that are kind of all around the honey. They're kind of keeping you from seeing what is there. The honey represents what is obscured, which is again our Buddha nature. Um, the, or Dharmakaya here in this case, in terms of the individual aspect of that, the nature of that. Dormant hatred is exemplified by these bees. Why? Because a swarm of bees is, seems kind of stimulated in that direction of being something agitated, something that is being triggered by things that we don't like. And so this is a kind of, um, again, related to the idea that this is obscuring our dharmakaya, which in essence is also obscuring our ability to really get at the definitive meaning of the sutras that teach the perfection of wisdom, that teach emptiness and so on, um, that really help us to develop that wisdom that will overcome our hatred. So that's in a brief way, you know, kind of what's going on there. Uh, the third one that has to do with dormant ignorance is grain within its husk. So you have a husk, like, you know, of wheat or something that has grown, and within the husk, is the grain actually residing inside there. The husk is what obscures it. What is obscured is the grain. Dormant ignorance is, is the obscuring factor, like the husk, and the dharmakaya, again, but more importantly, are the provisional meaning sutras, those sutras that also help us to know uh, the variety of the Buddha's teachings but not get at the definitive meaning of emptiness are what are being obscured there. So the first one was the, uh, the Dharmakaya in terms of the truth body of realization. We saw that. And we saw the Dharmakaya in terms of the definitive meaning sutras. And then finally, the Dharmakaya in terms of the provisional meaning sutras. All of those being, you know, the, the means through which we will awaken uh, our own potential for enlightenment, our own uh, full enlightenment in the state of Dharmakaya. Okay, then I'm going to go through the fourth. So those first three all get lumped together because they all have to do with the Dharmakaya aspect or nature of the Buddha lineage. Now we look at the, the one that is taught in terms of suchness. Yes, Venerable Palma. I'm not sure if I, I missed this, but I don't understand on the second one how that uh, says that's what it ex ex obscures is a dominant hatred. How How is it? I can under kind of, huh? The dormant. Dormant. The oh, dormant. Dormant, sorry. dormant hatred is obscuring the... Um, yeah, but how, wait, what's represented? I mean, how does this work with this example? I mean, I understand the kind of the first one. Uh-huh. That makes sense. This one, I'm, I'm having a hard time. That the swarm of bees represent that dormant hatred. And what they are doing then is that they are, by swarming around the honey, they are keeping one from realizing the honey, that there is honey inside the hive oh. that they are swarming around. Have you ever seen bees swarm? I mean, I, there was at the Light of the Path Retreat once, I uh -huh. came out of the back of, of what was Lee Hall, it's now Eureka Hall, yeah. and there was a swarm of bees. I don't know if you saw them, I mean, they were amazing. I was kind of freaked me out for a minute, like because I thought, what happens if these guys get agitated and come over and, you know, it, it seems you know quite like, you know, this agitated ball of bees that is all like obscuring something. But I, I don't know what they were around. They weren't around honey. They were around some. I mean, maybe they just get around each other. I mean, like there's bees inside of bees inside of bees inside of bees and whatever. So so. Oh, and the queen is kind of out of the hive, and so they're, yeah. Oh my gosh. Imagine coming back to your car. <laughs> so, 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 so uh, what we're trying to do is get to the honey, and we're all upset because the bees are all blocking us from... Well, I mean, in, a what sense, I in a sense, whenever we've got this dormant hatred that when it, once more, like I said with attachment, when it meets its respective objects, objects that are unpleasant, objects that trigger that type of emotion, 
it comes into the forefront and becomes manifest hatred. But nonetheless, I mean, the, the hatred, whether it's in a dormant form or a manifest form, is obscuring our Buddha nature. It keeps us from being in touch with that reality. Yeah, I think I'm just having trouble yeah. with the honey and bees. It's honey not so much bees. the idea, but, Let me see if but I to can, relate yeah. the, that dormant hatred with honey and bees, uh -huh. the relationship between those two. Let me read what Geshe Loden says. He says, The hatred which obscures the Buddha potential is likened to a swarm of bees. When a swarm of bees is strongly disturbed, the bees cause great harm to others by stinging them. At the same time, they cause great harm to themselves because in hurting others, they lose their sting and die in pain. Like that, when hatred arises in one's continuum, the mind is greatly disturbed and suffering is experienced by both oneself and others. And then talking about kind of the, the meanings of it, in terms of this, it says here for the bees. Mm. Buddha potential, oh, where is it? The truth, oh, maybe it doesn't explain more than that. Anyway, that's kind of the idea behind it. But that, I, makes, yeah. okay. that, that helps. Helps, it okay. helps to make some sense. Again, I guess I don't know enough about bees, actually. <laughs> I should talk to Mary Ellen. Good. Okay. So we're going to do the, the fourth one together. It's one of the three that I chose to go through because it's the only one that pertains to suchness, that, that aspect, that uh, part of the nature. And it's called uh, the golden side of filth. So let's read uh, verse 109 that begins this whole section. Just as a person's gold, which had fallen into a place of rotten filth, when that person was going about on the road, would remain for many hundreds of years there as it was before due to having the attribute of indestructibility. And just as a god with the pure divine eye, having seen it there, says to someone, take out this supremely precious gold that is here, cleanse it and make something such as a statue or ornament that is to be made from a precious substance, so the subduer, having perceived the qualities of the basic constituent, existing and sentient beings, sunk in the afflictive emotions which are like filth, makes fall the rain of excellent doctrine for all beings in order to wash away the mud of the afflictive emotions. So again, you have that wonderful example that is used here of somebody having dropped gold into some mud or filth and, and it didn't realize they had done it, but Nobody knows it's there. It's under the ground in this, you know, or in this, this mud, this muck. That muck being like the afflictive emotions that are blocking the Buddha nature of all beings. And so the, this, in this example here where you've got the kind of, what was it, a god with some sort of clairvoyant, a pure divine eye, sees it there and says, oh, there's gold there. You can take it out and use it because the gold will remain unsullied by the mud, right? You could take gold and leave it in mud for as long as you want, but the gold itself is going to still have that pure nature. It might need to be polished a little bit, and, but once you use kind of water to clean it off, it's already in a state where it can be used as gold. It has that gold nature. So it's similarly with regard to the Buddhas, uh, seeing our own basic constituent, our own Buddha nature, wants to point it out to us, wants to make sure we know that we can use the wisdom, realizing emptiness, to wash away the mud of the afflictions. And in that way, you know, the Dharma they teach is to help us to do that. Whoops. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, hold on to your seat belts. You know, here we're... Sorry about that. It didn't take me too long to get back here. Okay, so we're into the fourth simile. In this fourth simile, there are the gold, which is that which is obscured, the filth, which is the obscuring. The meaning of these are explained in the following verses. We already kind of talked about them, but we'll go into the meaning that is set out here. Just as filth is disagreeable, so because of being a cause of many faults, such as reliance on the attributes of the desire realm, through the desires of those having attachment to the desire realm, that which is aroused by the three poisons is a source of renunciation, like a pile of filth. So the meaning of the obscuring is the filth, which refers to 
the forceful manifestations of the three poisons. Whereas before we saw them in a dormant form, mm -hmm. dormant attachment, dormant hatred, dormant ignorance. Here it's like when they are fully manifesting in a forceful way, which was exemplified here again, because we have um, various attributes of the desire realm. We, based on those, we develop great attachment to the aspects of the desire realm. This is like Venerable Rabinus, her little thing I shared the other night, I think of, it's like being junkies born into a world of junk, right? This is our, what our experience is like. Because we have dormant attachment, it manifests in a very forceful way, mm -hmm. as does hatred, as does ignorance. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that which is aroused by the three poisons is a source of renunciation, like a pile of filth. We need to move away from that. That's what's obscuring our Buddha nature and keeping us in a pattern of continuing to create faults in samsara. So then let's read that which pertains to, you know, that which is um, the obscured. The suchness which is the nature of phenomena is always changeless, such that even though it appears to be related with afflictive emotions, there is no change in its own entity just as gold does not change by falling into filth. So this is the idea, again, of suchness or emptiness, which is what this, this example, the fourth simile, represents in terms of the, uh, what is obscured is the suchness of our own minds, which is that part of the threefold nature. And Let's continue. And it, na it is naturally virtuous and supreme, just as gold is beautiful and valuable. And in another way, it is virtuous in the sense that just as gold is fit to be crafted into adornments, so virtue is generated when suchness is observed. And the entity of the basic constituent is pure, just as gold is pure of defilement. So you get these wonderful ways of using this in a simile to demonstrate various aspects of the suchness of the mind. You know that... It's uh, virtuous in the sense that gold is fit to be crafted into these various adornments. We can craft our virtue on the basis of observing suchness, develop it further along the path to eventually attaining Buddhahood, you know, and that the entity of it is pure. And then, of course, at the beginning, that, that it's essentially virtuous and beautiful and valuable, you know, that our Buddha nature is the most valuable thing we possess in a sense. Therefore, this suchness is said to be similar to the form of gold. So the meaning of the obscured, the gold, is that it refers to suchness. Suchness is likened to gold because just as gold is immutable in nature, can be fashioned into ornaments and so forth, and the nature of gold is untarnished, similarly, the sphere of qualities of the mind is also unchanging by nature in terms of the emptiness, the suchness, the exalted wisdom that observes that suchness is virtuous, and its nature is pure of stains. It never was with any stain whatsoever of any inherent existence. We only had within our minds the adventitious stains that uh, can be removed through realizing emptiness. So, any questions? I think that's the end of the fourth one. Yep. Questions on that? Let's go to the chart to go through the ones that I don't have individual slides for, which again, I only am going to do number nine in that regard. We have now all of the rest of them pertain to lineage. Remember how we had the threefold nature of dharmakaya, suchness, and lineage. And in that context, we were primarily looking at developmental lineage, but nonetheless, we're going to start by looking at naturally abiding lineage, and that's the fifth simile which is the idea that there is treasure in the ground, but the ground is above it. Of course, you know, someone buried it there. It's been buried in the ground. And therefore, the treasure is what is obscured. The ground what is what is obscuring it. Here, the meaning of the obscuring is the ground of latencies of ignorance. All these latencies, um, seeds of ignorance and so on that have um, been with us since beginningless time that keep... Uh, us blind to our lineage, blind to the reality of this naturally abiding lineage. The ignorance itself, of course, is the ignorance that is adhering to the opposite, is adhering to things as inherently existing, whereas the, the naturally abiding lineage is the emptiness of the mind, the emptiness of our mind that's together with stains. So this is the, the treasure that we really have to, to reveal, 
is our own naturally abiding lineage, the emptiness of our own minds, but it's being blocked by the latencies of ignorance that we continue to be plagued by. The sixth one are sprouts arising from seeds. So you have a seed, and actually it says there the meaning of the obscured is a tree, but it's the idea that you have a whole chain of things that can follow from the seed sprouting. But when you see it in just a seed form, you don't see that it has all of that potential, right? Because all we see is a little seed, and we don't necessarily recognize this is where Venerable Rabina in the Discovering Buddhism video for Module 1, right? She talks about an acorn being a good symbol for what the mind is like. Because you know, of course we know that because we've learned that, that an acorn has that ability. But if you just gave an acorn, a bunch of acorns to kids and told them to play with them and they didn't know what they were, they wouldn't see the potential of that at all, right? They don't see a tr an oak tree in there. They don't see that that acorn, if planted in the ground, would sprout up and eventually become a mighty oak tree. Instead, they just see it as something else, whatever. Make, paint little faces on it or something, or use them like marbles, you know, flick them at people or whatever. You know? So this is, this is what is obscured, and what is, what is doing the obscuring is the seed that covers over that. So then you have here in regard to what is the meaning of the obscuring are the objects of abandonment of the Hinayana path of seeing, which is essentially all of our... Um, yeah, acquired afflictive obstructions. Remember how I went through that earlier. You have different levels of the afflictive obstructions that are removed. First the acquired, and then we go through the innate on the various grounds. And then we eventually go through, as bodhisattvas, the knowledge obstructions, and are there eventually abandoned on the three pure grounds. So we have here first the abandonment of those objects, which are the acquired afflictive obstructions. And that is the meaning of the obscured, is our lineage once more, but here our developmental lineage. And of course the analogy, the simile is really perfect, right? Because you look at that little acorn, and again, it has the potential to develop into an oak tree. Whereas some of the other examples aren't that dynamic, right? They're not about something growing. So it's a perfect example how that seed that has the tree within it, in a sense, and that it, once it is planted in the ground with the proper conditions there, will completely mature into this amazing, <laughs> fully developed thing that we call the tree. So that's what's really being obscured there. Um, number seven, a Buddha's form that's wrapped in rags. This one seems a little similar to the first one, but the idea here is, is that you've got this worn out cloth, these rags, and then you have a precious statue that's within those rags. And no one can see the statue because, of course, the rags are obscuring it. Here, what is obscured is the lineage in terms of our nature body, uh, the nature truth body, that is the emptiness of the, the mind of a Buddha, and the objects of abandonment of the Hinayana path of meditation are what are obscuring it, which are the afflictive obstructions that are innate. That's what's abandoned by someone on the Hinayana path, and when they fully abandon that, they attain our hardship. I'm going to go through these briefly, number eight, so we can make sure we get nine and go through the closing advice. A king and an ugly woman's womb. I mean, it's kind of unfortunate to use some of these things because beauty's in the eye of a beholder. Poor. Poor. Yeah, I think it's more destitute and stuff. I don't know why some of the language that these charts aren't really, I don't know, they aren't the best. A destitute or a woman who is of lower class. Of course, in India, there was a lot of this emphasis on caste system and what have you. So if you have somebody who's going to be born as a king or a universal monarch, as they're often called, you would think they'd be born from great lineage. They would be born from, you know, the, the Brahma caste or whatever, the, rather than the lowest caste. But in this case, you have this destitute poor woman of a lower caste who is giving birth to this amazing king, this... Uh, being who will do all these miraculous things as a ruler of this world. So the objects of abandonment of the seven impure grounds, which are the bodhisattva's way of abandoning things in terms of their abandonment of all the afflictive obstructions, those are obscuring our lineage in terms of the enjoyment body, which I won't go into all of the reasoning of that because I want to get to number nine, which is the example that I finally have here as the third example for all of you to take a look at. Did I go through that slide? Yeah, it's okay. Don't need to go through that one. The ninth simile, a precious image within existing within a clay mold. 
Just as having seen a statue made from melted gold inside an earthen mold of full size with all fe its features, its own entity being quiescent of defilement, but its outside having a nature of an earth mold, one who knows this removes the external obstruction in order to cleanse the gold inside. So having perceived that the defilements of the natural clear light are adventitious, Transmigrators who are like the earthen mold, which is the location of the precious substance, are cleansed of defilements and become supremely enlightened. So this is the kind of, oh, there's one more bit here. Just as one, oh, there's a few more bits. Just as one skilled in making statues, knowing that a statue contained inside an earthen mold, made from blazing undefiled gold, has a nature of quiescence, since it is without defilement, removes the earthen mold, so the omniscient wisdom of the Buddha, knowing the quiescent mind like pure gold, removes the obstructions through exposition of the doctrines, which are methods for this, by means of accomplishing the gentle pressure of the stroke that removes the earthen mold. So the way that someone would carefully remove the mold around the gold, once they know that this is how statues are formed, is inside this clay mold, then they would know that there's something that needs to be revealed, and they would gently, you know, through the pressure that they put on it, reveal the statue that is inside. So in the ninth simile, there is a precious image existing within a clay mold, which is that which is obscured, and then there's the clay mold itself, which is the obscuring. And the meaning of these is explained in these verses. The defilements related with the three pure grounds are to be known as like an earth mold that covers a golden statue. They are overcome by the Vajra-like meditative stabilization of those great beings at the end of the continuum of being a sentient being. So once more, I talked about this earlier, right then, so I don't need to talk about it again, that there's a Vajra-like meditative stabilization that the 10th ground Bodhisattva goes into at the very end of their existence as a sentient being. And on the other side of that, when they have the path of release, they are a Buddha. They're no longer a sentient being. They're a fully qualified Buddha and have removed all the defilements. They're no longer with any adventitious stains. So the idea here is that the meaning of the obscuring, the clay mold, is that it refers to those objects of abandonment of the pure grounds that are abandoned eventually in their totality, um, you know, the last bit of them when one has that Vajra-like stabilization. But obviously they're abandoned consecutively through these three grounds, the, the grosser levels on the eighth ground when one enters the ninth ground, the middling level on the end of the ninth ground when one enters the tenth ground, and then the subtlest level at the end of the tenth ground. So now the meaning of what is obscured, because of having the nature of a reflection of appearances in accordance with whatever will tame trainees, an emanation body is like a gold image. So again, the idea being that a gold can be um, molded in a particular way, what have you. It can, has that ability to manifest in a variety of ways, just as the emanation body can you know, help beings in whatever way is necessary for them in accord with their own karma. So it has this nature of a reflection of appearances, various appearances that could happen. The gold statue could be melted down and made into something else that would be more pleasing and more suitable for others. So the emanation body is like that. The Buddha is always just emanating whatever is necessary to help sentient beings wherever they're at, wherever their karma is. So the meaning of the obscured, a precious image existing within a clay mold is that it refers to the Tathagata essence in general, and in particular, the Nirmanakaya, the emanation body. So recall that the previous two were the enjoyment body and the nature truth body. Um, the Dharmakaya, body, you know, that truth body of realization was already explained earlier in the first one. So we have all the bodies of a Buddha that are kind of represented here in this uh, presentation of these nine similes. The slide continues saying, the Tathagata essence of sentient beings is obscured from being seen by them due to the object's abandonment of the pure grounds. Therefore, sentient beings have obscurations with respect to the transformation of the developmental lineage into the Nirmanakaya of a Buddha. So this is again just saying that, yeah, we have all of those. They are not our main kind of problem at this point. They're part of the problem, obviously. 
it's you know other things that are grosser that we have to remove just like we saw you know dormant attachment and all of these things the grosser levels of the afflictions we have to begin by addressing that and then we have to get to this ignorance and to remove the afflictive obstructions and then we have to eventually remove the knowledge obstructions those are much subtler than what we're dealing with but nonetheless they're all part of what's obscuring our buddha nature the emanation body itself is likened to a precious image fashioned from gold because just as an image fashioned from gold, though in nature gold, takes the aspect of a Buddha image of which there are many different kinds, likewise the emanation body is the exalted wisdom of the Buddhas, appearing to the eye consciousness of trainees as an emanation body of which there are a variety of emanations. That's it for the similes. <laughs> Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, very hard to go through those, right? Or in a Buddha shell or something. Um, in an acorn. Um, yeah, something. Any questions, comments? I realize it was kind of quick going through these, but again, if you were to study the text, you'd look at more of the supporting material from Gelsip J and kind of get clearer about some of these other points and, of course, go into each of these nine in much more detail. I like this little conclusion because then these are some verses that are in the text that kind of point to why this was taught. I mean, why do we need, to, I mean, it might be clear to all of us already, but nonetheless, there are certainly some things we can review from Maitreya that will help us to um, make the most of these teachings that we've had the chance to do this weekend. So near the end of the discussion of this fourth topic in the first chapter, Maitreya puts forth the question as to why the Buddha taught that sentient beings possess Buddha nature especially since the emptiness of all phenomena was taught extensively already in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. You know, it's interesting, this sutra, or the sutra that this is based upon, the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, is said to be part of the third wheel turning. Some of you may know this term of the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. The first was the first noble truths, where the Buddha set out the basic schema for all of what he taught, and it was primarily for Hinayana trainees that he said, this is what's going on, this is what you need to do to be liberated from it, and they went off and practiced it. But then in the second wheel turning, which the, was the perfection of wisdom sutras, you know, the teaching the emptiness of inherent existence, the wheel turning of that, the Buddha went on to teach to those trainees who were ready for that level of examining this concept of emptiness exactly what the nature of reality is at the most ultimate level. But then apparently there were some who felt like maybe that was going too far, and he taught the last wheel turning that's called the teaching of, uh, or wheel turning of fine discrimination, where he kind of indicated three different natures and said that some of them have some inherent existence and most of them don't, and da 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 da. And the Chitta Matrans kind of worked from there, whereas the Madhyamakas were very happy with the perfection of wisdom sutras. But nonetheless, Buddha nature was also taught in the third wheel turning. And so it does have some relevance within both Mahayana traditions, both the mind only, Chitta Matra, as well as the middle way, the Madhyamika. So this is the question that sort of raises, well, you know, why did he teach on Buddha nature if really everything you need to know about emptiness is right there in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras? So let's read the verse that kind of um, talks about this. Throughout the scriptures of the middle wheel of the doctrine, it is said that all objects of knowledge are empty in all respects, like clouds which are unstable and lack inherent existence, dreams which although experienced lack inherent existence, and a magician's illusions which although appearing lack inherent existence. But why has the conqueror said here in the scriptures of the final wheel of doctrine that the essence of a Buddha exists from the start spontaneously in the continuums of sentient beings. Maitreya provides the answer in terms of five faults that need to be overcome, the first two of which are specifically addressed by this text and by the Tathagatagarbha Sutra, while the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras were designed particularly just to overcome the last three faults, but nonetheless this text also helps us to be in touch with those teachings. So look at these, let's look at these five faults. The first is the poor discouraged mind, you know, which we can have on this path. You know, this is a long, arduous path, so we need encouragement where we can get it. So let's read what Maitreya says to that. It was set forth so that persons having the five faults might abandon them. The fault of a discouraged mind and non-enthusiasm for the path, which is to think that enlightenment cannot be achieved, 
This is due to not knowing the ultimate basic element exists in oneself, and such discouragement is an obstacle to generating the intention to become enlightened. So this is kind of you know pretty obvious in terms of what we're talking about there. Um, from Gelsip, uh, in his commentary, to abandon the fault of a discouraged mind and to develop bodhicitta. There are those who think that they are not of the lineage of the Buddha. Again, I mentioned how there are certain beings who uh, you know, may feel like they're not inclined towards the Mahayana, because there are some who are more inclined to the Hinayana, but nonetheless, um, we all can attain enlightenment. And, you know, if we think we cannot possibly attain the peerless enlightenment, then that becomes a serious obstacle to the development of bodhicitta. All right, then uh, let's continue with this um, in terms of concluding this first fault. For not hearing in this way that the basic constituent exists, some whose minds are discouraged due to the fault of deriding oneself, thinking, how could one such as I attain enlightenment, do not generate the intention to become enlightened, in which one thinks, I will actualize the nature, the ultimate Buddha. So he's just saying again that this is one reason we could say that the Buddha nature was taught, was because there are those who are maybe not as um, convinced yet that the lineage is that what they need to follow. They need to go into the Mahayana and achieve that goal, and they might even self-deride, thinking that, how could I possibly do that? Well, you have Buddha nature. You have the raw material from which enlightenment is formed. So you have liberation in the palm of your hands, enlightenment in the palm of your hands. And this is a, a wonderful thing to tell sentient beings, therefore. The second fault is non-respect for others having that non-respect for other beings. The fault of non-respect despising others as lowly, thinking that these sentient beings are low, this is due to not knowing of its existence in others and is an obstacle to assuming the care of others. So if we think of others in terms of their Buddha nature, that every one of them is just a Buddha waiting to happen in a sense, well then we're going to lose that sense of superiority and think we're better than others and we're going to be able to truly benefit others, help others. So to abandon the fault of looking down on others and to practice with the desire to bring all sentient beings to complete enlightenment, you know, this, this fault, um, you know, if looking down on others and not being able to, you know, attain enlightenment, therefore, is a problem. There are those who have developed bodhicitta yet do not see that all sentient beings are of Buddha lineage. They think that they have the ability to attain enlightenment while others do not. That's an obstacle to our bodhisattva practice. So another verse that pertains to this then. Some who have generated the intention to become enlightened fancy I am supreme, a bodhisattva, whereby they discriminate others who have not generated the intention to become enlightened as lower than themselves. The third and fourth faults are incorrect, incorrect conception regarding the defilements and deprecating the true qualities. These come together. The faults of incorrect conception, falsely holding that the adventitious defilements exist in the basic element, whereas from the start they do not, this is due to not knowing of its existence in all others and is an obstacle to the wisdom realizing the true mode of subsistence. So if we falsely think that there is some sort of inherent existence to these adventitious defilements, that they are there in our, our minds and will never be removed, well then... You know, that's going to be problematic. It's an obstacle to realizing the, the truth of the wisdom of emptiness. And then the fault of deprecating the true qualities, thinking that good qualities which are indivisible in entity with the basic element do not exist, whereas they do. Again, those good qualities being, as I mentioned earlier, the emptiness of the mind, as well as the sort of resonant compassion, uh, wisdom, or, uh, loving kindness, patience, all these qualities that are sort of there uh, together with that in the seed form. So Gyaltsup says, to remove the two faults of superimposition, thinking there's an exaggeration that these stains inherently exist, or deprecation, thinking that there's some lack of good qualities to the mind in the first place, and to understand the two truths without error. Apprehending non-truly existent faults as truly existing is an obstacle to the perception of the true states of, state of things and a superimposition. To deny the existence of the perfect dharma, the naturally 
pure basic element, the potential to develop every dharma of the Buddha is a deprecation. So if you're doing one or the other, either thinking that these faults are really there and inherently there, or whether you're thinking that the qualities aren't there at all and the emptiness doesn't exist and so on, well then you're, you're going to have a pretty major obstacle, right? But these, these three and four and five are mostly removed by the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, whereas the first two that we saw are to help us to have that awareness of our own Buddha nature so that we don't lose our own desire to continue to practice the path, nor do we look down on others because we see they all have Buddha nature and we're nothing, nothing that great about us. We just happen to have found that truth for ourselves, uh, that Buddha nature. So let's read the conclusion to those two, three and four. In those who think thus that the Buddha essence does not exist, knowledge of reality, the mode of subsistence free from superimposition and deprecation is not generated. Thereby they hold a view superimposing the unreal and not knowing the meaning of reality, deprecate it. So they're doing kind of both. You know, they're superimposing an inherent existence, deprecating the emptiness. Because of being fabricated by conditions and being adventitious, the faults, that is, the afflictive emotions and so forth of sentient beings do not exist as their, their own reality, it should say. In reality, those faults are selfless, and thus the basic constituent has from the start a pure nature of good qualities. The fifth fault, excessive attachment to oneself. All right. <laughs> and five, the fault of excessive attachment to oneself due to not knowing that the nature of the element of a superior's qualities is equal in oneself and others, this being an obstacle to realizing oneself and others as equal. So here we talk more about that kind of self-centeredness and self-cherishing. So to remove the fault of self-cherishing, Gyaltsev J says, in which one is excessively attached to oneself, this is an obstacle to exchanging oneself for others. Most of you know this as part of the technique to develop bodhicitta, where we, so we try to diminish the tendency to hold ourselves as more important than others and neglect the welfare of others by cherishing them first. And as His Holiness says, this is the way that you're actually wisely selfish because your own needs are best met when you are caring for the needs of others. You know, you will attain Buddhahood and have all the other good results on the way if you have a mind that is always cherishing others. What is it Rinpoche always says? The sun of happiness begins to shine when one cherishes others. You know, that this is really where all of our happiness comes from. So these are, you know, again, causes of to understand, uh, to exchange oneself for others and to understand the equality of self and others, both of which are causes of bodhicitta. The bodhisattva who possesses an attitude of holding unreal faults as the reason for viewing that the basic constituent does not exist and who deprecates the two qu true qualities of the powers and so forth does not attain the great love seeing oneself and sentient beings as equal. So, you know, this is an, uh, kind of a nice way that he wraps this up to some degree of kind of saying that essentially we do have to have that ability to see all beings as equal, as the same as ourselves. So this teaching was given, Gyaltsev J says, in order to remove these five faults in sentient beings and to develop the above qualities. Abandoning the five faults, one exchanges oneself for others and then develops bodhicitta. One then enters the practices, specifically the last two perfections. This is the reason for teaching and perceiving the existence of the element, as it's shortened to here, uh, the, uh, the Buddha nature. Okay. Um, there are some closing verses that I have here in the file that we can read that pertain to this whole process having gone through these, uh, this explanation and overcoming the five faults. So, from hearing in this way that the naturally pure realm exists without difference in all one generates enthusiasm for the path upon seeing that Buddhahood can be achieved, respect for other sentient beings that values them even like the teacher Buddha, the wisdom knowing that the conventional defilements do not inherently exist, the exalted wisdom realizing the entity of the basic constituent in which the basic element and knowledge are indivisible, 
and the great love which is the equality of oneself and others. So we were indirectly alluding to all of those qualities through the five faults. How we overcome them is through their opposites, each of those that were based on overcoming those faults. So due to generating those five beneficial phenomena in the mental continuum, there is no unseemliness because of being free from discouragement of mind and so forth. One views self and other as equal, without low and high. One knows the fact that the adventitious defilements of faults do not exist by way of their own entityness, and that good qualities are naturally possessed. And one attains the great love, which is the equality of oneself and sentient beings, as having the essence of a Buddha. From those five, Buddhahood is quickly attained. Voila. <laughs> okay, my voice is just about out, it feels like. But Any um, comments or questions on that? Quickly. <laughs> Quickly here has to be qualified. <laughs> no. um, yeah, I mean, the Sutra Path, again, does speak to this rather arduous amount of merit that needs to be collected. And this is why the Buddha taught Tantra is because there are those beings, not who feel like I need to get there quickly because I'm just sick and tired of being unenlightened, you know. It's because I need to get there quickly because sentient beings are suffering because I'm not enlightened. They will continue to suffer for three great countless eons until I become enlightened if it takes me that long to accumulate all that merit. Well, that's, that's heartbreaking to me. I mean, we should feel that what they call unbearable compassion you know, that cannot stand the thought that sentient beings continue to suffer. Therefore, we have to become enlightened as quickly as possible. So that's why we have to cultivate our compassion and our love continually so that it strengthens to that degree. Yeah, Kim had her hand up too. <laughs> um, can you talk a little about the difference between uh, the, the difference of the Buddha nature between the Madhyamika and the uh, Chitta Matra? Oh, um, I, Thanks. I'm not sure I can answer that question so much, Kim. This book that I've been referring to occasionally actually has the whole uh, kind of setting out of Buddha nature according to Chitta Matra, which comes from the ornament for the Mahayana Sutras, the Sutra Mahayana Sutra Alamkara by Asanga. Asanga, of course, was who we mentioned at the very beginning, right? Who was the disciple of Maitreya that was taken off to the Pure Land and given all these teachings and so on. And so he expounded upon some of those ideas. So it's kind of interesting. Maitreya, although he's got a strong connection to the Chitta Matran branch, obviously in this text was using the Madhyamika perspective and not you know, going to that. And even in Ornament for Clear Realizations, there are some hints of Chitta Matra, but it's essentially the Yogacara Svatan Svatantrika Madhyamika. It's not Prasangika, which is what we're studying here, the final school of the Middle Way, but rather one of the other branches of the other school of the Middle Way. So I don't know. I mean, I don't have the direct like understanding of it at the moment in my head. I'd have to go back and study it to be able, because it just wasn't something that stuck with me quite so much. And I'm not even sure that we studied it when we studied Buddha nature over in in Italy, even though we were in the Yogacara Svatantrako when we went through that, which does have some tenets of Chitta Mantra. I think its basic tenets around Buddha nature are more in line with Prasangika, with the Madhyamika. Do you know much about Chitta Mantra and mind only, how it's set out? I think there is a def different definition in terms of it as a uh, kind of a seed within the mental continuum that is pure or free. It doesn't talk about the mind itself being pure or free, but I don't remember more than that. Um, yeah, my understanding comes more from the, the sutras, the mm -hmm. Vietnamese, you know, oh, okay. Mahayana sutras, uh -huh. um, which mainly come from the Chinese schools. Okay. So essentially, you know, our understanding of the Buddha nature is more of a transformation right. from, you know, of the ordinary mind to the Buddha nature mind. Okay. So, so the the, so that's why I I was kind of like a little, you know, or I was a lot uh -huh. confused between uh -huh. the the permanence, the permanence, the impermanence, because. I attribute the impermanence very much to the dependent arising, right. but in a kind of like more okay. instantaneous way versus the, mm. you know, the 
the Hinayana mm. type mm -hmm. of impermanence. Right. But but it's it's the the emptiness, uh, the Buddha nature in terms of the Madhyamika in you know in mm -hmm. light of everything is emptiness um, seems to be fairly different from the Chittamatra consideration, yeah. which is that the mind really from the ordinary mind to the clear light mind, it's really quote unquote not empty per se. It's just a transformation. Okay. Uh, or at least that yeah. was my understanding and that's yeah. why I kind of get confused, confused a lot with between what's here. the yeah. two. Yeah, Thank and you. I wish I was better prepared to address the question, but I, I simply am not. I, I haven't studied it extensively. I think even Jeffrey Hopkins in Meditation on Emptiness goes into a whole section of Buddha nature from the Chittamatran point of view and then contrasts it with the Madhyamaka, but it doesn't all come back to me at the moment. I'm, I don't have the ability to retain a lot of the things that I've read, unfortunately, but thanks for that question. But I, you know, in the um, Lama Tsongkhapa and his Essence of Eloquence kind of really contrasts those two schools of the Chittamatra, of course, also against the Svatantrika and the Prasangika of the Middle Way. And there are lots of differences, certainly. From the perspective of the Madhyamaka, they think that the Chittamatra is still holding to some inherent existence of the mind and things, you know, so so it gets to be a very different perspective. But from the point of view of Chittamatra, they would say Prasangika is going too far in what they're negating, that they're falling into an extreme of nihilism, saying that there is no inherent existence of the mind in particular. So I don't know. I don't know more than that. <laughs> but thanks. All right, any other comments or questions before we wrap up? Okay, let's go to the prayers. I'll put on the final slide, which is thank you for your kind <laughs> attention, your participation, and your humor. <laughs> I have to thank you for your humor. Humor always helps when you're studying the Dharma. One teacher told me that if your study of the Dharma isn't fun, you're not doing it right. So <laughs> I think it is nice to have some humor. Let's go to that soak page again and do the first two verses there in the Tibetan this time and think about again what we've done over this last you know evening last night and all day today all this uh, all the seeds that we planted within our own mental continuum that we want to ripen for the state of Buddhahood but again not with self-concern not with that desire for my own well-being but the desire to have the well-being of all sentient beings be satisfied through what we've done here this weekend for our own enlightenment so we can lead all beings to that same state. So let's re uh, recite these two in uh, the Tibetan. everyone got the new prayer for His Holiness's long life, maybe we can recite that if you have a copy of it. If not, there are some on the table back there, uh, and you can take it with you, I understand, you know, if you would like one of those. Um, this is a prayer that Lama Zopa has recommended that we use in place of the prayer that we had been using. Not that there's anything wrong with that prayer, this is a prayer that he just feels is really important for us to be reciting right now for His Holiness's long life. So we won't do this in the Tibetan, we'll do this in the English, but before we recite this prayer again, think about not just His Holiness and not just Lama Zopa, but you know, whoever it is that we and others have as teachers, as guides in this world, even in other traditions, you know, other religious, spiritual traditions, what have you. May we and others continue to have perfect guides in our lives. May these guides have good health and long lives. May we never be parted from them. 
the wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Now back to the prayer book that we had. Do the prayer for Lama Zopa. Uh, we'll do this in the Tibetan. Many of you know the melody for that. O tub so chang ching jam gon gel way tan zin kyong pel way kun zo dog port se chok sum kor way leg mon tu dru Paha dag sog du je kun du shab ten shok. And then we'll do the final one in English there for Osohita, uh, that he may be of great benefit to the organization and to all sentient beings in this world. Venerable one, to you whose kindness exceeds that of all the conquerors for those wanderers in far off places, especially the West. Mindful of your loving concern for us in intentionally descending again into a family of a far distant land, we make this request. O Lama, please, please live long. Okay. So again, I hope this has been of some use and, and those of you who do have a desire to study it more formally in the basic program, that this plants some seeds for you to do that. It is, again, a bit longer course when that's done, but hopefully you've gotten kind of the gist of what it is by at least coming to this weekend. So, again, thank you so much. I really appreciated the opportunity to teach this.